Stratford's here. Meet Nesva Alex. Ocean Briatna. Do you like 150 days of winter? Let's Drop do it. this. Well, that's where the bad Russian is going to end. I have my politically incorrect Yushanka. I, of course, am in the beautiful Courchevel, which is currently covered in snow. And we're going to talk about the truth about the history of Russians in Courchevel. So back in March 2022, if you follow skiing in Courchevel, you might have come across such headlines as Russian exodus from Courchevel. Oligarchs flee the Alps. There's a sale at Penny's. Well, maybe not the last one. However, as someone who's lived in the resort for a very long time, I would like to try and separate truth from a good clickbait headline. Now, back in 1991, when I first came to Courchevel, I was uh, introduced to what is possibly the largest and greatest ski area in the Alps. And almost every year since, I have spent some part of the year here, which gives me a unique insight into seeing like the evolution of who has been skiing in Courchevel over the years. Now, funny enough, the first December holiday coincided with the dissolution of the old Soviet Union. Two years after the Berlin Wall fell, and the start of what was meant to be a new democracy, but instead turned into a sort of autocracy. And of course, the birth of the Russian oligarch. As the state-run concerns were quickly privatized, friends of the government became insanely rich, creating a new group of 20th century nouveau riche businessmen. And of course, what's the first thing a Russian one percenter wants to do? Well, he wants to leave Russia to spend his money. Of course, the first myth, of course, is Korshval invaded by Russians. Of course, more truthfully, this should read Korshval invaded by money. Now, if you were to believe every headline in the Daily Mail, a very popular tabloid in the UK, Korshval was invaded and occupied by hordes of oligarchs ever since. The reality is somewhat different. I've lived in Kushval every year since 1987, and using the unscientific process of observing the general mix of nationalities and resort. Now, of course, if you wanted to stereotype Kushval, then it would firmly be focused on the one percenters. Unlike other resorts, Kushval has positioned itself towards the rich and infamous. So between 1650 and 1550, you can see behind me is Aquamotion, big new swimming pool, okay? Back in 2010, this wasn't here. This was tennis courts and a go-kart track. Back in 2010, this was the site of what could be described as like Russian excess. It hosted uh, the 50th birthday party of a Ukrainian. I guess nowadays we don't need one of those anymore. Uh, Ukrainian steel magnate, Viktor Pinchuk, um, who, basically erected a 2,000 meter squared uh, marquee on the tennis courts down here. 300 guests, Michelin starred uh, chef cooking, maybe Alain Ducasse, not quite sure, um, with an estimated value of about 5 million euros. Um, with, of course, guests like Christine Aguilera and Cirque du Soleil. And I think what, what best sums up this um, ex excess is when the Mary were uh, asked back in the time uh, they said well if they don't spend their money here they're going to spend it somewhere else like Mejev. I think that sums it up perfectly. So it's not just the Russians. In 2015 a British millionaire went and put up a marquee inside the ice rink for a week while he celebrated his 50th birthday. Uh, such entertainment as Michael McIntyre and Madness, not on the same scale as the oligarch, but more of an example of the difference between a billionaire and a millionaire. Now, of course, in the first decade of the 2000s, there were about a thousand English seasoners working in resort every year in chalets and chalet hotels. I know this because I used to make a seasoner hoodie with everyone's name on the back. Now, using this as a reference to the number of English tourists 
was an order of magnitude greater. Sure, there were other nationalities, including Russians, but as an overall percentage, they were very low. As a benefit in the resort as a whole, a Russian oligarch might pay a small fortune renting a private chalet, but in the end, he only buys one lift pass. He only rents one pair of skis, only hires one ski instructor. Well, I guess that depends on how many students he has spending the week with. Sure, the long, expensive, pretentious lunches and the visits to the boutiques. However, as time passed, two things happened. The new Russian middle class started arriving slowly in resort, preferring Korshaval over Sochi. English tour operators' leases on chalet hotels and chalets disappeared because they were either redeveloped or private rentals became more lucrative for chalet owners. With prices now exceeding six figures for high season weeks, there was ample reasons not to lease to English tour operators. And as each year passed, so several of these properties disappeared and subsequently did the number of English holiday makers, eventually resulting in English holiday companies themselves disappearing as it was not viable to operate profitably. And this was a decade before Brexit was even a glint in David Cameron's eye. Now again, to be brutally honest, most Russian holiday makers were in Courchevel for maybe five weeks of the high season. Christmas, New Year, Russian New Year, half term, and maybe Easter, depending on when in April Easter fell. Over time, Kushval has been visibly accommodating with an influx of luxury hotels, luxury boutiques, luxury mountain restaurants, and the resort putting on special fireworks display, let's say for Russian New Year, that rivals even the previously amazing New Year's displays. So back in 2007, a very notable Russian billionaire was arrested in Kushval along with 25 others. How can we put them, say, students, in connection with an international prostitution ring? He eventually spent a few days in Lyon before being released. However, as stated before in the title, the word Russian could easily be replaced by the word money. Luxury doesn't care what about your country or skin color, just the color of your credit card. Now, my apologies for not knowing the correct collective noun for a bunch of rich Russians. So I'll stick with the word horde of Russian oligarchs have started to now be replaced by wealthy groups from such countries like Brazil, China, and recently the Arabs. Now, of course, rather like Knightsbridge in the summer, Kushval now sees an influx of Arabs from Saudi Arabia, Dubai, and Qatar with convoys of conspicuous German-plated black minibuses ferrying them around resort. They hide in their private chalets, enjoying things that are maybe unavailable at home. You know, like skiing. And of course, there's another popular myth. Russians tried to buy the resort back in the 2000s. Now, I love this myth because of its absurdity. The story was that a bunch of oligarchs tried to buy Courchevel in the 2000s. What does that even mean? Well, unlike America, where corporations own entire ski resorts, from hotels to mountain land and lifts, the Courchevel Mary doesn't actually own the land. They probably own the roads and regulate the services to the commune. Regardless, most of the mountain off piste is actually Savoie National Park. So the next myth is of course that Russians have bought all the large property in Korshev 1950. Now, before I go into explaining this, it should be pointed out that for at least 20 years, Korshev hasn't sold any new plots of land in 1850, which means, of course, if you want to build anything, you have to knock something down. Uh, I, of course, made another video about this in the past. The, the link will be up there somewhere. Anyway, However, if you were to walk around 1850, most of the streets in the, where the nice big chalets are, you will find that they, if I point out a Russian chalet, you, you will probably find that their neighbors are very much not Russian. And I can go through the, like, I know English people who have chalets up here, French people who have chalets up here, Dutch people, I mean, the list is absolutely, uh, 
Unfortunately, it's only the Russian chalets that get that much attention. However, if you are looking for the 1% of the 1% in Courchevel, you have to come right to the middle here in the Belcot. Behind me, this one-way road hosts some of the largest chalets. Actually, it's not just this road, this gated community behind me. There's another one behind the Hotel Belcot. Everything here is probably the most expensive chalets. Just to show that even the uber rich, I don't think really care. Behind me, we have a chalet which has a skip outside it. December last year, there was a fire in the chalet. And from what I understand, it was like save the art was the primary consideration. However, 11 months later, the windows are still broken from uh, when they were broken after the fire. You might have a 20 or 30 million pound, 40 million pound chalet, but who cares about actually having windows in it? Okay, so behind me is the Chalet Bergerie, one of the biggest chalets in Courchevel. In 2019, it was purchased by Ukrainian oligarch Rinat Akhmetov, who bought it from Russian Senator Vitaly Malkin for 77 million euros. But again, as a counterpoint, the two chalets which are behind me in these woods were recently sold for just south of 100 million euros which uh and they weren't sold to a russian either so uh yeah there you go it's not just the russians which brings me to the first of two Roman Abramovich stories. Uh, it was reported a very long time ago that he came here in the summer in order to look at a chalet to buy. He t flew into the LT port, was shown around resort, but all the chalets were either too small or they weren't on sale. And when I say they weren't on sale, they weren't on sale for any price, probably for the reason that I've just mentioned before. So uh, unfortunately, after that first go, he was sent on his way. Don't be, don't be too sorry for Roman. He did eventually come back and uh, purchase the chalet uh, years later. So there you go. And so of course we come to the myth of Russian exodus from Courchevel. When Russia finally invaded Ukraine on the 24th of February, many headlines read Russian exodus from Courchevel. But here's the truth. Because of COVID, the number of Russians turning up in resort was already greatly reduced. The Sputnik vaccination wasn't initially accepted by the European countries and by the time the restrictions were lifted, it was already February. The vast majority of Russians already in resort were those who lived in London and the south of France. And in the end of February marked the end of half term, meaning most Russians would leave anyway, not because of Putin, but because of school timetables. Now, of course, as you can imagine, rich Russians and broke English seasoners mixed together rather like oil and water. The Montjoie, La Grange, Le Cave nightclubs, and if you can remember Piggies, house the rich and the infamous. Whereas the Jump Bar, Le Keep, TJ's and Gringos house the rest of us normals. In a very rare occasion, Roman Abramovich wandered into TJ's wanting to watch the football. A Liverpool match, I think. He bought the bar for the night and the usual clientele were evicted. In the second half of the match, he did let some normals back in and even pose for photos before leaving. Okay, so there you go, the Russians in Courchevel. I hope you found it very enjoyable. If you have any comments, please leave them down below. If you enjoyed this, click the like button. If you enjoy seeing content like this, click subscribe, and I will see you all in the next video. Ciao.